Okay, our final uh, paper for this, uh, for this section of this morning's uh, conference is from uh, Scott Robertson, who's a PhD student in the centre, and Scott's working on issues to do with social identity, memory, and <coughs> titus. And I guess we're going to get a taste of that right now. So come on down. I wanted to be sure everyone knows I'm a Bible nerd too. Yeah. There you go. As is well known, the scholarly discussion of the pastoral epistles, and thus the letter to Titus, over the last two centuries has been dominated by issues of authorship, with the majority of scholars deciding in favor of the letter's pseudonymity, which I think is largely co correct. Um, the pseudonymity of the letter, however, raises other historical critical questions about the document, such as who is the intended audience, who actually did write it, and when was it written? Although his, although his dating can be widened, uh, John Marshall helpfully summarizes the state of the discussion, saying, quote, unless one is prepared to accept Timothy himself, Polycarp, or the author of Luke Acts as the writer, more specific ideas about the origin of the pastoral epistles than Asia Minor between 100 and 140 CE are scarce. The identity of the individual responsible for the pastoral epistles is inaccessible. And here he's affirming that the answers to these historical critical questions are essentially unanswerable given our current data. So a lack of answers to these questions, however, need not leave us with a, without a historical framework for studying Titus. The letter itself indicates Crete is that framework, and I propose that viewing Titus through Pierre Nora's idea of lieu de mémoire, pardon my French, or sites of memory, substantiates the claim that Crete is the historical framework in which the letter should be studied. The main advantage here, as I hope will be seen through this paper, is that it does not require the author of the text to be known to suggest a local setting for interpretation. Here I'll use the lens to look at Titus uh, to show that it serves as a site of memory um, of and for Crete. And after discussing these theories, I'll apply it to a Titus, and then hopefully, if time permits, we will test this thesis through looking at the reception of Titus. So, memory. Pierre Nora's site, uh, idea of Lou de Memoir essentially rests on and develops the work of Maurice Halbwax, who had the simple yet profound insight that memory is structured according to the social framework in which one is embedded and thus oriented toward the present rather than a simple reconstruction of the past. Because memory cannot exist without societal con constructs such as language, which one appropriates from society, all memory is, society, is social. Therefore, quote, the present group environment structures the reconstruction of the past even for the individual. With the emphasis on the construction of memory in light of present needs, there is no inherent assumption about the degree of connection between the past as it actually occurred and the memory of a community. Memory is instead a mixture of past and present, and the past in these memories may in fact be wholly fabricated. For Hobwax, the notion of a spatial framework is, in memory is essential. Memories themselves unfold within a spatial framework that is in some way connected to a physical landscape, which is not to say that Hobwax's understanding of a spatial framework was only strictly physical or geographical, but that he understood that there was a connection um, between, with the spatial framework and place. For example, he discussed life under the feudal system and the lords that ruled over the people. The abstract system of royal relations and prerogatives was tied to the land they owned, which in turn projected the memory of the ruling class to the people. The land itself evoked the memory of the landowner, and it was through this system of relations that the landed gentry retained their rights and privileges over the people. Um, in this way, a landscape of memory was tied to a physical landscape. And he did similar work with, uh, with the Gospels and showed that therein um, was narrated a, a spatial framework, which was obviously needed for ideas such as the crucifixion, but he also showed more abstract ideas such as the, uh, such as the parables were also tied to a spatial framework, um, somewhat vaguely in Galilee. And then in his legendary topography of the Gospels, Halbox also looked at, the, at how Christians read the Gospels and constructed ideas of the landscape presented in the text, and then tied them to physical locations in the Holy Land. In this way, mental landscape and physical geography were not simply mnemonic tools. The text projected 
a certain landscape of memory that was then read and appropriated by the readers, who in turn territorialized, um, so to speak, the landscape in a physical place. Pierre Nora developed these ideas of Hobwax mainly through his seven volume series on memory and identity of France created um, through memorial sites. For his analysis, he described the tool Lou de Memoir of Sites of Memory, which he reluctantly defined as, quote, any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element in the memorial heritage of any community. These entities are places, quote, where mem memory crystallizes and secretes itself, making them both bearers and agents of memory. In other words, there are any number of things, places, ideas, texts, etc., that, that are symbolic of a community's memory and a site where memory is recorded and passed on. As such, they are places where a community buttresses its identity. Nora emphasizes the constructed role of memory in sites of memory, and much as Hobbox did, emphasized that memory does not bear a necessary relationship to history as it actually happened. In fact, he sees memory and history as quite separate, um, such that in his conception, memory does not have history as its basis, um, an idea that has been heavily um, critiqued. He also indicates that it is not only the originally intended function that is important for these sites. He says, quote, what is the essence of this quintessential Lou de Memoir? its original intention or its return in the cycles of memory. Clearly both, all Lou de Memoir are objects, Mises and Abim, clearly my French pronunciation is a lot of work. Um, in saying this, Nora thus emphasizes that sites of memory can be originally intended to function in a certain way. However, the original intention of such a site is not solely important. The site has a function through the process of reception and rememorialization that is in that is independent of its intended function. Although scholars have heavily critiqued Nora's, um, elements of Nora's theory, his idea of sites of memory has been seen as a useful analytical tool, such as Jan Osman adapting it um, along lines amenable to his related but distinct idea of cultural memory, where he says, quote, the interaction of symbol and memory is a continuous process being played out at every level. That applies in particular to memory of the will. Whenever we think about something that we do not want to forget under any circumstances, we invent memory aids that range from the famous knot in our handkerchief to our national monuments. Such aids memoir are also the lieu de memoir, memory sites in which the memory of entire national or religious communities is concentrated, monuments, rituals, feast days, and customs. In other words, as Benjamin White says, Lou de Memoir are places where the memory of entire communities is concentrated, which encode formative narratives about the past as a means of socializing group members into the community's identity forming myth. They are places where memory is encoded and projected. So moving on to Titus. Nora's analytic um, Lou de Memoir has, as of yet, had little impact upon the study of the pastorals or Titus in particular. David Alney's article, uh, Jesus Tradition and the Pauline Letter, represents one of the few where the concept is employed that even mentions the pastoral epistles. He argues that to the initial recipients of Paul's letters, the letters served as AIDS memoir, affecting their commun communal memory. However, after the initial generation passed, such could not be maintained, and especially after the letters began to circulate broadly, their function shifted to lieu de memoir for affecting communal memory, especially in light of the large amount of memory-related language that would set up commemoration of the letters. He also briefly discusses the role that epigraphy plays in memory and notes that the pastoral epistles never served as aides memoir, but in their initial function, they were lieu de memoir. And two other studies are important to mention here. First, James Agison's work, Paul the Pastoral Epistles and the Early Church, discusses reception of Paul in the early church through the, through the lens of the pastoral epistles. Now, he's not employing memory theory in any way, but he's, do, he's doing very similar um, things. And he shows that the pastorals present an image, or if we want to talk about it in memory terms, a memory of Paul and how it was reflected in the early church. 
Second is Benjamin White, who I've already mentioned in his book, Remembering Paul. He discusses the way the image of Paul was received, especially in 3 Corinthians and Irenaeus. He builds his discussion, unlike Agassiz, he builds his discussion upon a solid um, theoretical framework from memory and attempts to reorient the discussion away from the real Paul of the Hauptbriefe to the way in which Paul was remembered. Although his discussion does not focus on the pastorals, he does mention that the pastorals serve as lieu de memoir for Irenaeus. White, in particular, helps in understanding biblical texts as lieu de memoir. He says, quote, normative texts as sacred indicators of author authoritative tradition function as lieu de memoir. They are material sites to which a community returns over and over again to hear a particular version of the past rather than some other. As a text that purports to emanate from Paul, and thus a normative and authoritative text, Titus would then fall into this category. The text sets itself up as a, as a site of memory by claiming to have the contents of the sound teaching to which the community and especially its leaders must adhere, and provides a version of the past to which the readers would be exposed. The studies just mentioned focus upon the importance of memory, the memory of Paul in the pastoral epistles and make the connection that they are themselves due to memoir of Paul. And although the discussion of Paul in these is important, it leaves other aspects of the memory contained in these documents to be explored. The letter to Titus does not encode memories only of Paul, but it also discusses Titus and it discusses Crete. Further, Nora's idea of lieu de memoir indicates that such would be important for constructing the memory of a community rather than simply recording and preserving memory. Um, although indirectly, the letter to Titus provides the readers with a narrative concerning Paul, Titus, and Crete. It indicates that a community of Jesus' followers had been established on Crete, likely due to the Pauline mission. And I'm sorry for that term. I just realized I need to change that. Um, <laughs> Titus travels to Crete, where he is instructed by Paul. There's an opposition with a particularly Cretan flavor, as chapter 1, verse 12 says, um, to the spreading of the gospel. So Paul leaves, so Paul decides to have Titus remain on Crete to organize the communities in all the cities of the island. Then Paul decides to spend, a, spend the winter in Nicopolis, after which he writes a letter to Titus giving him instructions for the Cretan communities. Titus visits the cities of Crete, um, correcting them quite quickly, and Titus visits Paul by the winter. This narrative underlying the letter describes the founding of the early believing communities on Crete and how and by whom they became organized, thus encoding a memory not only of Paul, as Agassiz and White discuss, but also of Titus and the community of believers on Crete. Although the historical veracity of this narrative may be dubious, it still creates a memory which, it was noted above, need not be based upon his history as it actually happened. As a site of memory, Titus is not simply a place where memory is crystallized and recorded, but as Nora says, it is a site where memory is secreted. You know, see, he already had my thesis in mind there. Um, where it is projected. It has the potential to affect the memory of a community. Further, it is not simply the original intentions of the creator of the site that is important, but also its reception which I feel is important here because we know so little about the origins of the past wars, we cannot simply assume that it was the author's purpose to provide a myth for the believing community on Crete, even though he actually has that in there. The implication, I believe, that can be drawn from Titus as a lieu de memoir is that it would have potential to construct memory, and that by naming Crete, it had the potential to construct Crete as a landscape of memory. In such a scenario, Titus as, a, as Lou de Memoir and Crete as a landscape of memory would then be particularly important for the identity of the believing community on Crete, making Crete the framework, um, making Crete the framework for interpreting Titus. Um, no one to say the only one. I want to make sure I'm being careful here. I'm not saying the only framework for interpreting Titus. However, to see if this is a viable theory, I would like to um, discuss the reception to see if that actually played out. So the reception history of Titus begins early, likely in the second century, although possibly as early as Clement of Rome, almost certainly by Polycarp. But the earliest sources do not contain a geographical destination, at least the earliest sources that we have. However, they overwhelmingly accept the work as an authentic Pauline writing. 
that it was accepted as a genuine Pauline writing indicates that it was treated early on as a lieu de memoir, as indicated earlier in briefly discussing Egerson's and White's work on the image of Paul in the second century writings. This does not, uh, this is, sorry, this does not present a definitive answer either way regarding the way the work would have functioned for Crete, but that it was received similarly to the genuine Pauline's points in the direction, although slightly, of it having a similar function for its ostensible destination as did the Pauline the genuine Paulines for their actual destination. The first extant work, uh, some have argued that the Acts of Paul originally narrated a journey of Paul and Titus to Crete, but there's a lacuna in the text there. So the first extant work that provides insight into the memory of Titus and Crete outside of the New Testament is Eusebius's ecclesiastical history um, from the early fourth century. In recording the apostles' first successors, Eusebius mentions that Titus was the bishop of Crete, uh, which is also mentioned in the apostolic co constitutions from later that century. This idea was quite strong in the century, such that Ambrose, in the introduction to his commentary on the letter to Titus, also calls Titus the bishop of Crete. The localization in these traditions is uh, quite a bit stronger than that mentioned in the letter to Titus. In the New Testament, Titus appears simply as an ap apostolic delegate um, with a short-lived but important role on Crete. He's not mentioned as a bishop or really even staying there all that long. Um, with the letter to Titus as the beginning of this tradition, these letters, these later authors indicate that Titus has indeed served as a lieu de memoir and that Crete was a landscape of memory in which the tradition of Titus was localized in an increasingly concrete way. Um, so, I'd like to skip ahead to um, discussing the Acts of Titus, so, which I believe is the most striking example of the reception of Titus. Um, this rather late text, it probably dates from the fifth to sixth century. It begins by claiming Titus was a descendant of King Minos and that after studying Homer quite extensively, God told him to stop reading Greek philosophers. So Titus began reading Isaiah, naturally. Um, then the proconsul of Crete, who happened to be Titus's uncle, hears of Jesus' birth and baptism, so he sends Titus to Jerusalem, who wit and Titus there witnesses much of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The Acts of Titus identifies Titus as the Cretan mentioned in Acts 2.11, 2 who became a believer. Titus is then ordained by the apostles and sent with Paul on, a missionary, on his missionary journeys. On their journeys, Paul and Titus come to Crete and convert the island's proconsul. Then Paul and Titus leave Crete and go to Asia. But after Paul's death, Titus returns to Crete, where he remains, where he remains for the rest of his life, working many miracles on the island. So the Acts of Titus goes well beyond the aforementioned traditions in linking the memory of Titus with Crete. Titus is identified for the first time in an extant text as a native Cretan. The text goes farther than identifying him as a native of the island by making him a descendant of King Minos as an ancient king of Knossos and a relative of the head of the local Roman gov government. He was probably the most Cretan person alive. Um, the Acts of Titus um, then goes on and presents him as an apostle in his own right. Um, he was an equal to Paul rather than simply as delicate as the Pauline epistles indicate. Titus has an extended stay on Crete after the death of Paul and drives out idolatry from the island. So Titus here is foundational for the memory and identity of Cretan Christianity according to this text. So although many of the details of this text go well beyond the canonical writings, it shows clear interaction with them. Um, Titus is first mentioned in connection with Crete in the letter to Titus, as far as we know. So the Acts of Titus is building on this tradition, even though the epistle is never explicitly mentioned. It, it evidences as well growing strength of the memory of Titus in Crete and a trajectory that increases his association with the island. Also, unlike other documents mentioned before, the Acts of Titus is unanimously understood to be a document from Crete, indicating that this memory was alive not just outside of Crete, but on the island itself. Um, further, this is similar to the findings of Hall blocks um, related to the localization of memory found in the Gospels. Readers of Titus 
found the place mentioned in the, in the text and territorialized the place around the memory encoded in that text, showing that the text and the place are acting together. Um, the above texts indicate that the canonical letter to Titus did play a role in the memory of Crete. Titus is identified quite strongly with the island uh, through his being called the Bishop of Crete and through his bringing Christianity to the Cretans. Further, Crete played itself played a major role in the memory of the letter to Titus. As the canonical letter indicates, Titus is shown throughout the history of reception as an important figure for the establishment of Christianity on Crete. However, the role of Crete in the memory of the letter becomes amplified throughout these traditions. So, conclusions. As an, earlier, as an early writing purporting to come from an eminent authority, the letter to Titus functioned as a lieu de memoir, an object that contains and transmits memory. As such, its naming of Crete turned Crete into a landscape of memory where it interacted with the letter to Titus to influence a local identity as seen through the history of the letter's reception. Through the early fathers and the acts of Titus, there was an increasing identification of Titus with Crete, a tradition that had its inception in the letter to Titus. Since then, the two mutually reinforce each other, Crete as a landscape of memory and Titus as a lieu de memoir. It is valid to see Titus as a formative document for local Christian, uh, Cretan Christianity. And I know that term's anachronistic, so I'd just bear with me on that, please. Um, the letter to Titus then was a document that helped shape the identity of the Jesus movement on Crete. Because of its um, importance for creating a memory of Crete and that it was an important, appropriated as a memory for Crete, this gives the letter a localized setting as a valid framework for interpretation. That is the island of Crete. Thank you. So you're saying your point what? <coughs> reception history to say the question giving yes or no answer to this question is not as wrong as observing the significance of the fact that it is now. Yeah. They assume that it is. Right. They create these narratives out of that assumption, correct? Right. The, whether or not Titus himself was is that what you're asking? Titus himself? Right. Yeah. Whether or not Yeah, whether or not Titus himself or even the was associated, actually went to Crete or was associated with Crete, or that the letter as we have it was actually written to Crete um, doesn't really matter. Um, that's not the right way of saying it. it. It matters, but it doesn't matter for the fact that it became a localized tradition and it, through its instantiation, it was then associated with, with Crete. Joe? making that memory do? You know, what, why is it there? What, what's the purpose of doing that, I guess? That's, um, given you've got this, you know, all Cretans are, are liars right. and gluttons. And, <laughs> right. um, it's certainly not about, you know, we're Cretans. Right. Um, that there's something, it's problematizing Crete as a place at the same time. I just right, it is. And, and those are questions that I'm trying to look into. Um, so I don't really have an answer to you on, on those. I'm, I'm looking for an answer myself, but you're right, it does. The fact that it's setting the letter on Crete and then also you know, having some pejorative ideas about Crete certainly problematizes um, their identity. And, <laughs> oh, sorry. No, 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 no. no. Or maybe um, embarrassing to me. <laughs> um, 
short answer, no, I don't, <laughs> because I've been trying to wrap my head around this theory too much, but I bet Chris does. Um, are you talking about specifically with that um, chapter 1, verse 12? Well, I, 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 guess, I guess the whole tradition. Right. Is it, is it a, yeah, so the tradition itself has, has two levels to the way Cretans viewed themselves. You're right. One, they would view themselves as being from particular cities, like the Canossians particularly didn't like the Gortinians um, or you know, other various cities on the island. But then at the same time, there was a sense that they viewed themselves as Cretan, and they did not like, sort of, they didn't like foreign invasion. If, especially if there's an attack from the outside, they're going to view themselves as Cretan, particularly Cretan. And you're right, this idea of Cretans are always liars is presented as an insider perspective, um, coming from uh, best guesses Epimenides who, uh, from Crete, where he says Cretans are always liars. And we don't have the text, we just have to trust ancient sources. So on the one hand, it's coming from an insider, um, emanating from an insider. And talking about the, um, the boundedness, the geographic boundedness, islands in themselves, there's been a good bit of um, literature, especially in archeological research on identity and how the bounded nature of an island has its own particular um, force in the way identity is constructed rather than a, a less defined place like Galilee, like you said. So it, it does have some, some relevance that it's a bounded place rather than a, rather than a non-bounded place. But as to the, the specifics, that's, what I'm, that's one of the questions I'm looking into. Okay, then, thank you very much. Thank you.